Hi, today we've got the last video for a while on the ESP32 clock and what I wanted to do today specifically was have a look at increasing the contrast on the matrix. So what I found is the contrast is quite poor on the matrix because we're getting quite a lot of bleed from one LED to the next. It looks almost like there's a bit of a glow all the way around this cloud and what I want to try and do is 3D print some kind of baffle that can sit over the top of this and basically separate out each of the LEDs. Now, it might be quite difficult because the pitch of these LEDs is quite fine, but we'll see if we can print something out. Let's have a look at the CAD. So this is what I've drawn up. It's just slightly larger than the matrix itself. And then we've got a whole load of 0805 sized cuts into it, exactly spaced according to the PCB CAD file and hopefully we should just be able to slide this over the top of the LEDs if it will fit and if it prints okay and that will give us the separation and prevent any light bleed. Right, so we've got this just started off on the 3D printer. It's just printing the raft at the moment just so it's got something a little bit better to adhere to. I'm still playing about with these 3D printers. I've got one of the resin ones in the background as well. This one is the CR10S Pro and like I said, I still Got a bit to learn on these. I'm still fiddling around. I think this one needs a few modifications as well. But generally speaking, it seems to be printing stuff okay. So here's the first print and it's got two problems really. Firstly, it's far too thick. So I need to decrease this thickness. The other problem is that the scaling on the 3D printer in this direction is not quite correct. So by the time you've got to the end, it's lost about half a millimeter in overall length compared to what it's supposed to be. So I need to have a look to see what we can do to adjust that. But it does actually work as a baffle, so we can place it on top of the LEDs. And if I push down, you can see all of the light bleed onto the surrounding LEDs has completely gone. So you can see around where it says Thursday, and then you compare it with over here, you've got much better isolation of light on these letters. So here we've got version 2. This one's really quite thin and this printed very quickly. It looks pretty good. So you can see the light bleed before. And then if we place this over the top, it does actually sort of click in place over those LEDs. It's quite a tight fit. And there we go. So that's it snapped in place and it does actually stay there all by itself. But now we're getting no bleed from one LED to the next. Also, we've got really quite a wide viewing angle. It works a lot better than the other one. So that actually works really quite nicely. So once that's behind some acrylic, I think that's going to look really neat. Now I've been playing around with the ESP32 quite a lot since the start of this project. Previously I had no experience of it. It's been quite a steep learning curve as to how it works. What I've found is it's not very good at low level control of hardware like we're doing in this project. It's okay if you've got other devices offloading some of the processing. But what we've got here is some tasks that need to occur at very strict intervals and also each of those tasks is quite labour intensive. What I should have done is have either a separate PIC or other microcontroller on the board dedicated to the multiplexing of the display or use some dedicated hardware driver chips. What I found is even with the highest interrupt priority on those timers it doesn't seem to give exact timing each time you go into that interrupt. There seems to be some jitter and the result is quite visible on the matrix. What we were seeing is that if a task came in just slightly late, one row of the LEDs might look brighter than the previous one and you'd end up with some kind of shimmering. You can still see a bit of shimmering but that's only the camera. It's completely perfect by eye now that I've played around with a few settings. But things like the timers and the PWM for the LED brightness, you don't get quite the same control that you would do on a PIC Micro or some other device. So there's no way to synchronize the PWM with the multiplexing. So what would be nice is if you could reset the PWM timer at every multiplex interval. What I was finding is that there's some drift, which is also causing some ripple. And basically, it's very difficult to align timings on multiple tasks on this device. So what I've ended up having to do is increase the PWM frequency for the brightness control all the way up to 100 kilohertz, just so that it never beats against the multiplex frequency. And I was a little bit concerned about how much emissions we'd actually have from this clock now that we've got some quite high frequencies all over the board. 
So what I thought we'd also have a quick look at today is using some of these software defined radios as a spectrum analyzer and just see if we can see what noise we're getting from the PCB. So these are relatively inexpensive and quite powerful devices. So this is the Hack RF1. This is a clone, I think, which you, it is open source, but uh, I didn't buy the original. This one is from Banggood. It was relatively inexpensive. I think it came in at about £130 or something like that. And then we've also got the SDR Play RSP2 Pro, which is a nice device. It's got two inputs. Again, it's got quite wide bandwidth. Uh, this one is all the way up to 6 gigahertz, so really quite incredible device. This one is a little bit lower, but it has two separate inputs that you can use separately. So let's have a look at some software for these. So this is RSP Spectrum Analyzer for the SDR Play device. It's available from their website and it seems to work really well. So it operates just like a standard Spectrum Analyzer. Obviously the settings on the right hand side are a little bit more restrictive than you get on a proper Spectrum Analyzer but it seems to work quite nicely. And then what I've done is I've just rigged up a simple magnetic probe which plugs into the antenna port and it's just a loop which allows us to look at some of the fields coming off of the PCB. Okay so if we bring the probe over towards this switching regulator here you can see the switching frequency of about 180 kilohertz along with each of the harmonics and that is really quite visible. This one is providing the 15 volts supply to the clock face at the top. If we start moving along we can see the second switching regulator. Now this one looks really noisy because this switching frequency is 180 kilohertz and that's providing power to this LED matrix. At the same time, what we're also seeing on the display is a frequency of 100 kilohertz, which is our PWM frequency for this entire matrix. So we're seeing that superimposed on top of it. So it really does look quite noisy. If we hover over the LEDs, there's a little bit less noise. Mainly what we're seeing is that 100 kilohertz. We've sort of lost the switching frequency and we're mainly seeing that 100 kilohertz or so PWM frequency. So the rest of the PCB looks generally quite good. Uh, we're mainly just seeing that 100 kilohertz noise from the PWM frequency because everything is being turned on and off at that same frequency. The rest of the PCB is generally shielded by a ground plane, so we're picking up a bit of noise on these tracers here, which go to the anode drivers for these LEDs, but everything is sandwiched between a ground plane on the top and the bottom layer, so the overall noise is not too bad, it's just from specific components. If we hover directly over LEDs, and this is pressing the loop directly over them, you obviously can see some noise. So I think these software defined radios are going to be quite useful coming up for some of the projects that I've got planned because we've got some switch mode power supply projects and we will want to see what is going on. So you know when you're hovering over various parts we're going to want to see what noise is coming off them to indicate whether we've got a problem or whether we're seeing what we should see from those switch mode power supplies. And in the absence of having a proper spectrum analyzer it does look like these fairly low cost devices are going to do a really good job of just giving some visibility of what's going on. So we're going to be moving on to some new projects now. I think this is the last time that we'll see this clock. Maybe I'll feature it again once I've got the acrylic front cover done. But big thank you to JLC PCB for providing these boards. So what I will do is I'll upload the firmware and the PCB files to the website, if not tonight, over the next few days. I'll also put some links to these two devices in the description down below. They're actually really fascinating to play with, especially these slightly more fully featured devices. You can obviously get the super low cost ones, but these ones are really quite nice. So we've got the dual input on this, um, and along with the high impedance input. And the Hack RF1, as you know, is a very popular device and has extremely capable functions all the way up to 6 gigahertz. So a really nice device for looking at microwave uh, transmissions as well. And aside from the spectrum analyzers, which are really useful, having a sniff around the various frequency bands is really quite interesting and it might be quite fun to see what's going on on the 43 and 868 megahertz bands, see if we can see what's being transmitted by via various things. I hope you enjoyed the video and until next time, thanks for watching.